great. Thank you. Welcome back to the last set of presentations. Is this better? OK, thank you. Welcome back to the last set of presentations. We have more for, uh, four more to go, so here we are. Uh, my name is Athir Arawaili, and today I'll be talking to you about my capstone project, comparing traditional visual reinforcement to audiometry and um, reaching for, ta uh, for sound audiometry in two and three year olds. Here's a quick outline for what I plan to cover. I'll go over an overview and then go over the methods, results, and discussion sections of the current study. So we know that the two um, standard clinical methods for audiometric testing in young children are visual reinforcement audiometry, or VRA, and conditioned play audiometry, audiometry, or CPA. VRA is appropriate for children six months to 36 months of age, and CPA is appropriate at about 30 months. So there's an overlap for the children in the age range of two and three years old. In this population, at one extreme, children are the oldest they can be for VRA, and at the other, they are the youngest for CPA. So with that in mind, um, VRA can trigger qu quicker habituation, and CPA can be too, co too complicated for these kids. So what happens oftentimes is that um, children get rescheduled for another hearing evaluation, and that ju is just inconvenient for the family and the audiologist, but it also can delay the identification and treatment of hearing loss, which can have detrimental effects on the child's development. So when no reliable results can be obtained from VRA and or CPA, um, a sedated ABR is typically recommended. And so there's a need for a more age appropriate method for testing these kids. So let's just forget about head turns and typical play tasks for now and let's consider reaching tasks. And in this context, reaching is a hand movement that results when children <coughs> hear a sound generated by a toy or an object and, and reach for it in an attempt to hold it. Research shows that infant as, infants as young as four months can, complete, um, can accurately complete reaching tasks with great reliability. So reaching has been successful in evaluating localization abilities. One particular study um, done by Lutovsky et al. in 2013 assessed localization abilities in two and three years old uh, children and showed similar success. In this study, an innovative method named um, reaching for sound or RFS um, was used and children listened to acoustic stimuli coming from one of nine possible loudspeakers positioned in a semicircular apparatus like the one you can see in this picture. So each loudspeaker was uh, positioned above a curtain covered hole um, behind which toys were hidden and after conditioning the child to reach into the hole uh, for the toy then uh, their ability to localize was, was assessed. So how about using that reaching task um, to assess hearing? It seems that a similar reaching procedure can be used for establishing behavioral thresholds. And in fact, uh, this was done, so the RFS method was modified uh, to be used for assessing hearing in children two and three years of age in a capstone study done in 2015 by Caitlin O'Brien, who's a UW graduate. She used a similar setup, except that she used two um, holes instead of nine, um, comparable to VRA with the head turn being either to the left or right. And she compared this method to VRA and actually found that it was both feasible and highly reliable. So I was interested in continuing to investigate RFS as a method to assess children's hearing in this age range, and I specifically wanted to know the effects of using RFS as opposed to VRA on threshold accuracy and completion time in typically developing two and three year old, real, real, <laughs> year old children. All right, so let's take a look at the study's method, starting with participants. To meet the inclusion criteria, children had to be typically developing native speakers of English in two and three years old. In one visit, um, we completed an autoscopic examination, and we obtained behavioral thresholds at 500, 1,000, 2,000, and 4,000 hertz, 
using both VRA and RFS in a counterbalanced manner for each child. And I kept track of the time of the total time spent uh, for each method. At the end of the visit, um, a, pair, a very short parent survey was administered. So for VRA, the traditional clinical uh, setup was used. And for RFS, children were conditioned using a 1,000 hertz, uh, 1000 hertz warble tone at an audible level through either speaker and having a test assistant sit by the child and guide the child's hand into the hole to grab the toy um, on the side of the presented tone. Another test assistant would be sitting behind the apparatus and <coughs> placing those tangible toys or stickers. So the child was considered um, conditioned when he or she uh, demonstrated a two time locked um, independent reaches um, in response to two consecutive tone presentations. After that, thresholds were established using the down 10 up 5 uh, standard method. <coughs> so here's the fun part. I had 14 children enrolled in this study. 11 of them were males and 3 were females with a mean age of 34 months and they ranged from 24 to 44 months. Of the 14 total subjects, seven were able to condition to and fully complete both tasks. Three completed or were able to condition to VRA only, and uh, three were able to condition to RFS only, and one child could not condition to either method. That one child um, was the youngest in our sample. He was exactly two years. So the results I'm going to present next pertain only to this subgroup of children who were able to condition to both tasks. In this subgroup, we had five males and two females. The mean age was 37.7 months, and they ranged for, from 31 to 44 months. The first measure we looked at is threshold, and this graph is showing the four frequency uh, pure tone average threshold for all seven children. We have the testing method on the x-axis, and the intensity in DBHL on the y-axis. On average, VRA thresholds and RFS thresholds were very similar. A pair two sample t-tests was conducted and no significant difference was found within subjects when comparing the two methods. So the next measure we looked at is time. Again, we have method on the x-axis and time in minutes on the y-axis. On average, RFS took 1.7 minutes longer than VRA, but this was not st statistically significant. But do keep in mind that this is a small sample size. We're looking at sev uh, data from seven, seven children only. The survey that I administered had two questions. The first one asked, what method do you think was more interesting for your child? And they answered one, uh, or circled one of three options. The head turn was more interesting. The reaching was more interesting or no preference. And the second question asked if both tests provide the same reliable and valid information, which one would you prefer? And the options were the same, the reaching, the head turns, or, the, or no preference. So five parents answered the first question saying that they thought RFS was more interesting for their child, and two said they had no preference. For the second question, Two parents thought VRA was, they preferred VRA. Two uh, parents preferred RFS, and three had no preference. The two who preferred VRA were the two that had no preference in terms of which one was more interesting. All right, so my discussion points. We, after analyzing the data, we concluded that RFS may yield similarly accurate thresholds as VRA and that it may take slightly longer to administer and that not every child will condition to RFS just like not every child will condition to CPA or uh, VRA either. Applications of this method in the future, we could use it to supplement VRA when VRA does trigger habituation before we gather all the information that we want to get from the child in an appointment. And it could serve as an alternative to ABR um, so kind of a middle step in between VRA and ABR to try out. The limitations of the study is the small sample size and the need for resources. We needed two test assistants sitting in the booth in addition to the person running the audiometer 
and the needs for the apparatus and tangible reinforcers. So future directions, we want to test more participants to gather more information. And I'm actually currently continuing to schedule subjects. So if any first years would like to work with me on this, uh, come talk to me. We could include a measure of re reliability. Um, I originally um, did that in the study, but I did it in an inconsistent manner. And we ended up excluding it from the data analysis because of that. But in the future, with more participants, we can uh, make it more consistent and include it in there. But I, want, I just want to say that in the first part of the study um, that Caitlin O'Brien completed, uh, she did find that it was reliable. And then we want to include children with hearing loss and with developmental delays. One last thing I want to share with you. Um, this is an adorable story that a parent emailed me after I had tested his child. He said, after so-and-so got home from daycare, he told his mom and me that he was going to show us how to do the hearing test. He then unfolded his little tent and grabbed a blanket and toys and showed us how to recreate the game. My wife played different notes on a toy electric piano to make the sounds while he reached through the holes to grab toys hidden behind the blanket. <laughs> I know, I had the same reaction. I'm like, oh. <laughs> All right, I want to thank uh, my capstone advisor, Dr. Hartman, for the endless hours and effort she put in helping me with this project. My committee members, Dr. Douglas, Douglas, Dr. Fowler, and Dr. Henning for all the great suggestions and feedback, and the awesome volunteers who really were great in helping me with these children, Ariel, Chantal, Katie, Kayla, Meg, Megan, Michael, and Will, and the participants and their families. Here are my references, and I'll take any questions at the, this point. Katie. Um, so the question was for the parents who preferred VRA, um, why was that the case? Um, actually, those resu results that are presented were only from the children who did both. Um, I didn't notice anything with the two methods that was different or if the child looked uh, bored or anything with that. Um, but what you were referring to, I, this is not something that I presented today, but with the children who conditioned to one of either the two methods, I did see that parents were more uh, likely to choose the ones that their child conditioned to and not the other. But those that I presented were only from the children who are conditioned to both. Hannah. How do you think adverse parents are doing this? Like, do you think it's um, because they're not getting the same benefits from the other methods that they Yeah. I think at this point, with this method not being um, formalized or standardized, it is a little harder to transfer it to a clinic setting. But I think with more research, um, there could be um, a better way to do it, uh, maybe with um, a sort of uh, equipment that would place the reinforcers by itself, kind of like you can control the VRA toys to light up from a distance do something like that. But yeah, at this point, it's a little tricky. Dr. Lee? Um, my question is kind of twofold. This age range doesn't generally struggle with impulse control, and so leaving out those false positives, at least for VRA, can be kind of difficult. Mm -hmm. So my question first being, did you find that there was more or less false positives with the repeat? And did you find that it was easier or harder to tell those false positives? Um, I actually found that there were way less false positives with RFS. Um, and what I did for reliability, although I did not present this because, uh, like I said, it wasn't inconsistent in how I ca calculated it, is I inserted a number of control trials um, that was not the same number for each child. So some children, I inserted five control trials, and they didn't reach once. Um, so they had 100% false po uh, or 100% reliability. Um, but yes, some children I only inserted one and they 
did turn their head in VRA, and so they had 100% false positive rates, so that's why we did not, we excluded that from the data analysis. But both the first part of the study and mine, um, just from uh, observation, I did notice that it was more reliable than VRA. And I think um, with the head turn as a response being so easy to turn your head, whereas the reaching as a different response is more, kind of more meaningful, I think that does help with the reliability in RFS. Um, yes. Yeah, um, actually my inclusion criteria, I did not specify that they had normal hearing. I wanted to test children with hearing loss, and, but I just didn't have anyone um, with pre-diagnosed hearing loss um, enroll in the study. Um, I think um, it could be, um, if it's not something motor in their development, I think other children with uh, developmental delays um, can perform this task. Um, I know with tangible reinforcers with TROCA, the, um, I don't know what it stands for, but I know that that method uses tangible reinforcers and it, that it was developed for children with developmental delays and it works maybe better than other methods, so I do see it um, being applied in that, for that uh, population, yeah. Good question. All right, thank you.